All right, good afternoon. My name is Nate Nardi Cyrus, and I'm a conservation and land use specialist with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Hudson River Estuary Program through a partnership with Cornell University. Uh, and I'm here today to pose the question, where are the wild things in the cities along the Hudson River in New York State? I feel like that might be what these folks in the picture are asking, uh, and I'm certainly going to help answer that question today. But I also want to look a little deeper and try to not only answer the where, but also the how, as in how are these cities protecting that biodiversity that sometimes seems so elusive. Uh, and we'll also try to uh, relate this to environmental justice, um, which, you know, the connection isn't uh, always extremely obvious. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the Hudson River Estuary Program is a uniquely non-regulatory program of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, established to help people to enjoy, protect, and revitalize the Hudson River and its valley. So our program works throughout the 10 counties bordering the title Hudson, from Upper New York Harbor to the Federal Dam in Troy to achieve this goal. Uh, and within the Estuary Program, our conservation and land use team works with municipalities uh, and our regional conservation partners to incorporate important biodiversity uh, into local land use planning and decision-making. Uh, I'd also really like to let everyone know that we just released our 2020 State of the Hudson report, uh, and we encourage you all to check that out. That's available at our Estuary Program DEC webpage. Okay, here's the outline for today's presentation. I'm going to start off with an introduction to the many small cities that are found along the Hudson River, uh, followed by a look at some of the wilder places within these urban areas. Uh, and finally, we can look at some examples of how these cities are protecting these areas using their municipal home rule authority. Okay, so here you can see a map of the Hudson River estuary and its associated watershed. Uh, for most of the watershed is in, within New York State, which provides a tremendous opportunity for coordinated management and monitoring within this landscape. Um, and I want to share one of the most interesting statistics describing the estuary watershed, um, which comes from the DEC Hudson River Estuary Program and Cornell University's Wildlife and Habitat Con Conservation Framework for the region. Um, so with just 13.5% uh, of the state's land area, this watershed supports nearly 85% of its animal diversity. Uh, and this is likely due to the diversity of landforms, you know, with low river uh, valleys characteristic of the mid-Atlantic region um, to the high uh, peaks that are uh, of the adjacent Catskill Mountains and then everything in between. Uh, and that makes conservation, even in urban areas, a necessary part of maintaining biodiversity at both state and regional scales. So here you can see all of the cities along the estuary. Uh, while New York City and Yonkers in the south are, are really massive, uh, the rest of the cities are small to mid-sized um, with significant natural areas, including uh, uh, significant portions of Hudson River shoreline. So I'm going to be showcasing four of these cities in the presentation, starting with the city of Peekskill, which is adjacent to the brackish part of the Hudson River estuary. Um, Poughkeepsie is at the extreme limit of the salt front um, with a small amount of salinity only during the driest months, uh, while Kingston is along the regularly freshwater portion of the Hudson. Uh, and Rensselaer, across the river from Albany, uh, is also situated on a freshwater tidal section of the Hudson River. Okay, so where are the wild things? Um, this is a view of the city of Poughkeepsie. So we're looking toward the city now. Uh, and it shows some typical characteristics of most Hudson River cities. Um, we have here an extensive urban canopy that's interspersed with pockets of dense development and impervious surface. Um, and there's the Hudson River with some natural shoreline, um, but a majority of that shoreline is uh, is actually hardened um, through parks or, or um, uh, in the case of the Hudson River, we have two active rail lines that run adjacent to the river on both sides. Um, and this separates the shoreline from upland areas in many places. Um, but there still are plenty of wild places. Uh, so I want to dig a little deeper. Okay, so here's the city of Peekskill. And this is again along the lower portion of the estuary. Uh, in 2018, the Volunteer Conservation Advisory Council asked the estuary program to assemble a report to document known important habitats and species of conservation concern in the city. Uh, and here you can see one of six maps that was included in that report. Uh, so, but this one um, describes the most prominent known biodiversity resources in the city. Um, 
can see the large forested area to the south was identified in a, another local biodiversity plan as a conservation priority, uh, as it's nearly 2,500 acres and home to some rare vernal pool obligate amphibians, including um, rare marbled salamanders. Um, so it's a pretty interesting feature there. Uh, this forest is also just within a few miles of the globally significant forest of the Hudson Highlands. Um, in the north, the tidal mouth of Ansvelt Creek is home to spawning river herring habitat um, and is a migration route for uh, American eel. Um, the tidal mouth is also home to rare brackish intertidal mudflats uh, identified by the New York Natural Heritage Program. And that's what the arrow is pointing to. Uh, the brown and green hatching uh, that are near that indicate important habitat for rare species modeled by New York Natural Heritage Program um, using their database of rare species occurrences. So you can see the intertidal mudflats are particularly important for the state threatened spongy arrowhead. Uh, this small annual plant is particularly threatened by disturbances in and adjacent to their intertidal habitat. So, you know, land use planning that is happening in, in adjacent peak scale is really critical to this population's persistence at the site. Okay, moving up the river, the city of Poughkeepsie recently completed a comprehensive natural resources inventory, um, which included a detailed habitat map produced from biologists from Hudsonia. Uh, and you can see here that this is a more detailed mapping effort that documented small urban habitats. Uh, so that included things like waste ground, exposed ledges, um, what Hudsonia describes as cultural areas, so, you know, golf courses and, and lawn areas, um, but indeed there are also some wilder places too. So the Vassar Ecological Preserve uh, is in the southeast corner of the city and contains the municipality's largest concentration of wetlands, upland meadow, and forest habitats. Another really important uh, resource in Poughkeepsie is the Fall Kill Creek. Um, so this small Hudson River tributary is used by migratory American eel uh, and has been the subject of the estuary program citizen science efforts to monitor those eels since 2008. Um, so this years of data collected by both high school students and college students uh, has not only helped local officials understand the value of a largely channelized urban waterway, um, but it has also helped local residents, many of which are from historically underserved communities, to develop a relationship with their local biodiversity. Um, and it's just plain fun getting in the water in, uh, in early spring. Okay, so the upper estuary is really substantially different from the areas I've discussed thus far. And here the river uh, was historically shallow and wide with many islands and back channels uh, that have since been filled with dredge spoil. Uh, in this part of the estuary, the city of Rensselaer is also creating a natural resources inventory and is currently working with our program, Hudsonia and Dr. David Hunt to finalize their detailed habitat uh, and biodiversity maps. Um, so the city of Rensselaer again, is across the Hudson from Albany. Uh, and while most of uh, the city is developed, there are major pockets of newly mapped habitat that are still present. So you can see this large forested area in the northern part of the city, um, which includes nearly a mile of Hudson River intertidal shoreline and associated floodplain forest, um, really spectacular. Um, while this area is within the city limits, uh, the highly erodible clay soils that are characteristic of this upper part of, of the estuary have always made development pretty difficult here. Um, and it's worth saying that a variety of habitats uh, in this location and the high concentration of rare plants found in this part of the city uh, make it really a unique natural area in the county. Another biodiversity hotspot is within this uh, broad steep-sided valley that runs through the middle of the city. Um, and here the New York Natural Heritage Program has modeled potential important habitat for the rare Midland club tail dragonfly. So this insect's larvae are sensitive to alterations to stream habitat, um, but in this case uh, that potential habitat is buffered by 70 acres of adjacent municipal parkland shown here. Okay, so I want to wrap up this presentation with a couple of examples of some Hudson River cities who identified important natural areas and then went on to use their municipal home rule authority to protect the biodiversity that they found there. Before I go into that, I first want to show a, a simple planning framework that we always encourage communities that we work with to follow. Um, first, you have to know what you have by assembling regional and local data and publishing a municipal natural resources inventory. And we've seen a couple examples of this already. Um, uh, next, we want communities to prioritize areas and plan next steps using that natural resources inventory as a foundation. 
right? And finally, these plans, um, um, using these plans, uh, we hope that they protect and manage priority areas. Uh, and they can do that either through local legislation, uh, project review, or directly through land conservation. Okay, let's start with our friends uh, in the city of Poughkeepsie, right? They started with a natural resources inventory, which included that detailed habitat map uh, that I was sharing earlier. Uh, in addition to that habitat map, uh, the city also included 26 other maps that included resources such as street trees, flood prone areas, impervious surfaces, and that goes on and on. Um, soon after, they used their natural resources inventory to draft a local law that would protect those resources during their planning board review process. Um, and, and in a sense, this was their planning process. Uh, as they articulated, the draft law had a goal of preserving and improving the quality of the city's environment for present and future present uh, generations, rather. Um, and then finally, in 2019, the city's common council um, passed that law. Um, and I want to dig into that just a little bit before I move on, because I think that's really important. Okay, bear with me on the legal language here. I will spare you the rest of this law, but the critical part is highlighted right here. Um, the planning board and the city planner shall ensure that proper protections of natural resources identified in their natural resources inventory are incorporated into the design of projects and mitigate impacts on those resources. So this law really gives the city the leverage that they need um, to have their project applicants um, submit a conservation analysis, first of all, uh, using that natural resources inventory, and then also to adjust those projects uh, to mitigate damage to natural resources. Uh, and this is a little abstract right now, so let's look at an example of it in practice. Um, the city worked with Vassar College to set up an ArcGIS online web mapper to increase the accessibility of natural resources inventory data for project applicants who need to complete an analysis. Um, and I wanna focus in on this area here. Um, this is the only natural floodplain left on the portion of the fall kale that runs through the city. So as I said before, the rest of the stream has been fully channelized. Um, the natural resources inventory specifically calls out the protection of this area as an environmental justice issue, um, since downstream reaches run through almost exclusively low income areas of the city. Um, and protection of this area might be the city's last chance to save flood storage capacity that could mitigate uh, risk to downstream low-income residents. Um, and as luck may have it, this past year, a developer actually proposed a new project that would encroach on this floodplain, which is not significantly protected by really any other form of local regulation. Uh, the city is now working with the developers to redesign that project to greatly minimize the impact to those floodplains. Um, and, and really, this is what success looks like in municipal conservation. Um, Well-executed inventory and planning that results in these kind of meaningful protections of priority natural areas. Okay, I wanna end with a look at the city of Kingston. Uh, first, they created a natural resources inventory that included a Hudsonia habitat map, as well as other natural resources data, um, similar to what was included in Poughkeepsie. Uh, they then used the map to create indices of parcels that intersect with the data mapped in the inventory. So when a municipal uh, official wants to know which parcels contribute, say, to their urban forest, they can get a list of those. Um, this project also resulted in an overlay analysis to identify conservation hotspots in the community. You can see those dark red areas are, are areas of intersecting resources. Um, both of these efforts ultimately served as the foundation for the city's open space plan, which set the stage for a series of land protection wins in the city. Um, and I wanna talk about those right now. Uh, this map is a terrific visualization of Kingston's open space plan. Uh, you can see there's a lot of goals articulated here, but I'm gonna really focus in on land protection. So this year, Kingston Land Trust and Northeast Caves Conservancy protected 14 acres of forest in this Rondau Uplands priority area. So prior Hudsonia surveys had identified the cliffs and caves on these parcels as important habitat for rare bat species and the regionally rare plant purple cliff break. Um, in addition, Scenic Hudson, uh, which is a, a local land trust, purchased 500 acres of abandoned quarry located in the Hudson Uplands priority area. Um, and while this land is heavily denuded, uh, as it was an abandoned quarry, um, the property is largely forested now, and the newly naturalized shoreline um, buffers some globally rare freshwater tidal wetlands from some negative upslope impacts. 
Okay, so the neighborhood parks priority area was not designated to provide any protection to wild places. Um, but I do want to talk about it because open space plans are this kind of natural intersection between environmental justice and biodiversity conservation. Um, in this case, social justice advocates and environmentalists work together to engage residents and identify areas in the city that were without access to existing parkland. Um, this data was then used to identify this parks priority area, uh, where the plan specified that new parks should benefit the historically underserved Midtown district of the city. Um, well, in 2019, that dream was actually realized when a group of local conservation partners acquired a lot in that section of the city. Um, on this small parcel, ground penetrating radar had confirmed a suspicion that this was, in fact, a mass burial site for enslaved Africans since the 1600s. Um, so this kind of Discovery galvanized a coalition of community groups, along with support from the mayor, um, who worked with local land trusts, and, and ultimately this land was protected. And you can see here part of a design proposal for a new urban park that honors those that were unceremoniously buried there hundreds of years earlier. All, all amazing conservation wins. Um, just can't say anything more. <laughs> So Kingston and, and the other Hudson River cities have been models for conservation in our region for years. Um, all of these exciting new projects uh, and strengthened protections for natural resources and biodiversity prove their commitment to the environment. Uh, and, and more and more cities are working to support diverse natural and human communities, um, both of which are really necessary for their communities to thrive. Okay, thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, there should be some time for a few questions. Uh, and I'll, I'll stay on the line here.